This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. Today's subject is divine appointments. And let me explain to you what they are so that we all are on the same page. A divine appointment is when God brings people together to do something special in their lives. Now, you have to understand what that says. It isn't, God, it isn't me manipulating. It, it, it isn't a program that's, that, that I memorize. It's just simply God bringing me together in an airport. God bringing me together in a craft store. God bringing me together uh, on a sidewalk, in a park, in a grocery store. God bringing us in life together with somebody to give a message to them from him. So these divine appointments are when he speaks through us. Isn't that scriptural? That God speaks through his children, people who love him. And, and that's what makes church so alive to me when it's not just simply worshiping, which I love worship, but it's experiencing God personally by doing something. Hmm? And so divine appointments, let me give you that again. A divine appointment is when God, God, which he's about to do something in this service today that I don't exactly know what it is, but I'm excited about it. My wife called me right before I left the hotel today, and the last thing she said to me was this. Just think, sweetheart, somebody's life is going to be changed forever today. And I thought to myself, that's what, that's what I've come for. That's what it's all about. I love being with my family, but there's more to it than that. God has a plan for somebody today to do something very special in your life. And to give you an example of this, I had something happen just recently. This is brand new. The day before I left to come here, it was, uh, I believe, Friday, I was doing a, uh, a craft project with my grandson. And we ran out of some stuff, and uh, I wanted to finish it before I left with him. And so I went to the craft store. And I was in the aisle buying the things that I needed when there was a young woman that was buying something uh, and standing next to me, and she had on a T-shirt. And the T-shirt read, I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it, let your soul guide you. So the T-shirt, let your soul guide you. And that that interested me that, what that was all about. And so I, I said to her, um, uh, may I ask you a question? Oh, sure. I said, I just feel like I, I, I'm interested in what that means, let your soul guide you. Oh, she said, uh, well, she said, about a year ago, I became a Christian. And I bought this shirt, but she said, uh, I met a, a boyfriend, and the boyfriend and I didn't go to church, and I left the church, and so I'm not a Christian anymore. And she paused, and she said, well, to tell you the truth, I don't know what I am. And when she said that, all of a sudden I realized I wasn't in that craft store just to buy crafts. There was a young woman that said to me, I don't know what I am anymore. And so I said to her, uh, I, I, I just want you to know that I'm a Christian. And I believe in a thing called divine appointments where God brings people together to give them a message. And I just feel like I need to say something. He wants me to say something to you personally right now, period. 
And, and she just kind of stood and looked at me. She said, well, what? I said, I believe that God wants me to tell you that he loves you and that he has heard your prayer, period. And when I said that, immediately she began to cry. And not, not just cry, but sob deeply. And after a while, she said to me, how did you know? Well, I always know when God's up to something when that happens. Because I had absolutely no idea what's going on. When you have done divine appointments, it's like you, you're looking in a window. And God's doing everything. How did you know? I said, know what? She said, this relationship that I had with my boyfriend that was dragging me down, he was using me, and I got tired of it. And he said, she said, last night I broke up with him, and I'm devastated. And I got up this morning, and I'm looking in my closet for what I'm going to wear, and I see this old T-shirt that I had a year ago. And she said, when I put that T-shirt on, she says, God, I want you to speak to me through somebody today to tell me about the future of my life. Did you hear that? Let, let me say that again, because that is so like God. I want you to, sp she, she said, I want you to speak to me through somebody about the future in my life. And I said to her, I believe that's exactly what's happening right now. She said to me, will you pray? I said, oh, yes, I'd love to pray because that's what this is all about. And so we prayed together in that store, and all of a sudden I, re I saw tears coming, and I realized there's, she's, she's doing it. There's a new name written down in glory. Give the Lord a clap offering, would you? Divine appointment when God does something special through you that you don't even know what's going on. It's all God. That's why I love divine appointments, because nobody can take credit. You can't build an evangelistic association on it. Why? Because it's purely God, and he moves in spite of us. And so I, I said to her, do you have a church? And she's wiping her tears away. No, no, I, I don't have a church. And so I got out uh, uh, my pencil, and I, I carry three-by-five cards with me sometimes, and I I wrote down the church's name that my wife and I attend and the pastor's name, and I said, uh, this is a church that we attend. If it's all right with you, I'll tell the pastor that you're coming this Sunday. Would you, would you go up to him and introduce yourself and say that Dr. Watson had a prayer with me because this happens regularly? Uh -huh. He already knows what's going to happen because this is what happens. He then takes the people that I pray with, with divine appointments, out to dinner and finds out about them. And they feel like they're a part already. Isn't that wonderful for people to feel welcomed? Huh? And so uh, I said, just go up to the pastor, and I believe that he'll, he, he and his wife may take you out to dinner. And, and she said, you think they will? I said, well, if it's not this week, I know it'll be next week. Okay, so what thrills me is that I'm teaching you about divine appointments, but back home in the church that my wife and I attend, there is a lady that may be going right now up to the pastor and his wife saying, you know, there was a man with big eyebrows in a craft store. I don't even know his name, but you know what he did? He prayed with me, and he told me that God was going to help me with my future. Would you help me? Oh, give the Lord another clap offering, will you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I just get excited about what God is doing. And I want to share with you now in Scripture, I, 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 I love the Scripture. I, I, well, your pastor is a great Scripture person, and that's what I, I was drawn to him, but I want you now to follow along with Scripture because in the Scripture there is a divine appointment example that is classic. Hmm? And you'll know it because it's one of the 
most uh, revered uh, stories in all of the Bible, and it's a divine appointment. Turn with me to Luke 10, verse number 25. And here it is. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, he replied. Do this and live. But he wanting to justify himself, asked Jesus, so who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Now, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But, but so too, a Levite, when he came to the place that the man was, what did he do? He, say it with me, passed by on the other side. Have you ever wondered why they did that? We're going to get into that in a minute. But now a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the person was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and touched him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring in the oil and the wine. He put the man on his own donkey. He took the man to the inn. The next day, he took out silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, Jesus said, which of all these do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, oh, the man who had mercy on him. And Jesus looked at him and said, go. And do likewise. Well, the teacher in me always loves to make Scripture come alive. And so what I want to do is I want this Scripture to just come alive today like you will never, ever forget it. And as we're doing this illustrated sermon, I'm going to be teaching on things that maybe are new to you with the story. So that's exciting to me. So we have to start with the traveler. So where is my traveler? All right? So we have our traveler. All right, come on up here. Thank you for being my traveler. And just a little bit of teaching before he travels. He's going from where? Jerusalem to where? Jericho. Now that's important with the geographic uh, presentation, and I'll tell you why. Because Jerusalem is on a plateau, a high plateau. Jericho is down by the Dead Sea. And any time you have such a, a, a massive um, uh, elevation difference, usually the earth splits and a valley happens. Okay. And that's exactly what has happened here. There's a valley between Jerusalem and Jericho is called the Valley of Shadows. Now, there's other ways to get to Jericho, but the Valley of Shadows is the, the, the fastest, but there's a problem here because there's huge boulders that cast shadows, and robbers can hide behind the boulders and take advantage of travelers that are trying to cut a few minutes off their travel. You understand? And, and, and Jesus is really using this as... We're all on a journey, aren't we? Every one of us are on a journey, and we never know what a day is going to present to us. Some days go by fine, but there's other days that you find that there's robbers that take from you. 
And so now we have this traveler who's decided instead of going around the Safeway, he's decided to be risky and to go down through the Valley of Shadows. Oh, the Valley of Shadows, you know what that is. David talked about it in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil. So you know, that's the valley that we're going to be talking about that this uh, traveler is, is doing. So if you would take, uh, go over to Jerusalem, and now I need a robber. Where is the robber? Oh, the robber. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. Now, here, just between you and me, let him have it. Don't hold back. Just let him have it. All right. So just, All right. just stand right here. Just stand right here. Now, let's just pretend that this is a boulder. And let's pretend that our robber is behind the boulder, and he's going to do what robbers do. All right? All right, so come on over here with me now. And uh, so here we go. You're going from where? Jerusalem to Jericho. On your way. <laughs> Good. All right. Now, and take his wallet. Go ahead and take his wallet. All right. That's good. You, all right. You got his wallet. All right. And now let's give him a hand. That robber was good. All right. Let's give him a hand. No, 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 no. Don't help him up. You're robbing him. I mean, you're beating him. You're, you're beating him. You're leaving him half dead. You're just beating the life out of him. In fact, you want to kill him. You don't want him to live. You were trying to lift him up. You want to put him down. All right. Take your seat now. Thank you. Let's give him another hand. All right. So now we have the traveler, and, and sometimes the traveler reminds me of just us in life, where, you know, it just life, life isn't fair, but God is faithful. So now the robber is here dying, dying, and so now we have somebody, <laughs> somebody, yes, that's right, somebody that, oh, this person his whole life is to help people. He's called the priest. Now, could the priest come? All right, come on. Yeah. Everybody, the hero of this story, when it's, when it's being told by, uh, they think that the priest is going to be the hero. All right? And let's just see what happens. To, what, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I've had travelers before, but this is a good traveler. All right, so, Mr. Priest, do what the Bible says you did. All right. The Bible says the priest didn't touch him, but walked by on the other side. Let's give the priest a hand. Now, here, here very important, because I was always um, down on the priest. You know, that's terrible. This man's dying, and he just, his whole life is to help people. But he, do you, does anybody have any idea why, perhaps, now the Bible doesn't say exactly, but perhaps, why did the person walk by on the other side? Why did the priest walk by on the other side? Oh, that's it. Wow. My goodness, and you married the robber. <laughs> oh, his brother. Oh, oh. Okay, sorry, sorry. D didn't mean that. All right. So you're re you're related. Thank God you're related. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Now here it is. And if you didn't hear her, she hit it right on the. In Leviticus, it says that if a priest touches anything that's dead. He becomes ceremonially unclean. And what the, what the consequence of that is, is that he has to withdraw from his priestly duties for a period of cleansing. Now, think about it. What, what does this mean? The priest came and looked at the situation, and here's what it is. His priestly duties were more important than a human life. Now, I already told you that God convicted me, 
because I thought really badly of the priest. But do you know that we do that every day? We, we, we have our agenda. And ministers, we have our priestly duties for the flock. When in reality, there's people that may look okay on the outside, but inside they're bruised and broken and bleeding. Just like that girl in the craft store. She looked okay, but inside she was devastated. She had lost her worth and value and dignity. And what she needed to know was that God still was there. Uh-huh. And God is so good because what he does, he brought a child of God in the aisle and realized, I have a message for you. I want to talk to you. Well, what do you want to say? God loves you. And he heard your prayer, and she's astonished because she says, how could you hear my prayer? I prayed it early this morning that somebody would come by and talk to me. I didn't hear your prayer. God heard your prayer. So I just want us all to learn from the priest to be more sensitive to people and to be willing, and it's this, see the need and then just pray. It's amazing how, here, here's my three things. See the need, plant the seed, and watch it grow. When you talk to people, you'll find out in that story, and if you just listen to their story, people, I love talking to strangers. And my wife says, how do you love talking to I said, because everybody has a story, and I love people's stories. And so they're not a stranger when they're telling you their story. And say, in everybody's story, there is the time of crisis. And many times it's what they're dealing with. And when you see that need, I'll just say to them, could I pray with you? I believe in divine appointments and I believe God has brought us together. Why? Because he wants to do something special for you. Now, for a person devastated, sometimes all they need to know is that God cares. And for somebody to come by that they don't know, without an agenda, without selling something, without being a part, with just simply a simple prayer. And do you see how you can do that? It isn't just me. God wants us all to be open to divine appointments. Do you feel that with me today? Oh, I love that. Okay, so the priest, all right. Now the Levite, where's the Levite? Where's the Levite? Okay, good. All right, now, the Levite over here, the Levite is on her journey from where? Jerusalem to, and if you would just do what the Scripture says you did. All right, same thing. Give her a hand. Same thing. Why, why did the Levite do that? That's it. All right. The, all the priests came from the tribe of Levi, so that law applied to everybody that was a Levite. The, the Levites were really church workers. And, and, and I, I think to myself, how if we're Sunday school teachers, if we serve in the church, if we're deacons, how we can get so caught up in our job that we forget about our mission? Wow. Get so caught up in our church duties that we forget about why we're here. You see, this building is not just for saints. This building is for the bruised and the broken and the maimed. This is not a bless me club, even though I love worship. The worship recharges my battery so that this place can become a hospital where you bring people that have been going, that are, that are like the traveler, that are hurting and just need people to love them. We talked about that last night. So then the Levite walks by on the other side because, well, now they're not a priest, but they're a church worker, and they don't want to leave, lose their position while they're ceremonially unclean. Oh, that speaks to us. Help us, Lord, to be more than position holders office holders, 
egocentric, self-righteous. Oh, am I talking to us? All of us. Help me just to serve you, Lord. And if it's no title, I don't need a title. All, all I need is to be out there and to let your voice come through me to a girl on the third aisle over. Let your soul guide you. So now we have the, the, the priest, we have the Levite, oh, the Samaritan. Where's the Samaritan? Okay, now our Samaritan. Everybody hated the Samaritan. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you realize that the Jews were proud people, and they did, they, if somebody wasn't Jewish, they hated them. The Gentiles were proud people because they hated the Jews. And, and, and they were proud to be Gentiles. And here is a Samaritan who comes along in the story, and everybody says, he's not going to be the hero. But you know what? God uses people that are available. <laughs> Did you hear what I'm saying? All he wants is for you and me to be available to him. And he'll speak through you, and you'll see miracles. You've heard about miracles in Africa, and you hear missionaries talk about them. You can have a miracle. I had a miracle just before I came here in aisle four. A real live miracle who said to me, how did you know? All right, so the Samaritan did what now? Take your journey. First thing the Samaritan does is what? He came to him. The priest came to him, okay? He had compassion on him. Kneel down, kneel down. And then he went to him. Here's the difference. What he did right now is he touched him. And the moment he touched him, he was different than the priest and the Levite. Why? Because he's going to help him. See, you can talk about the world being lost, but why don't you help your neighbor? You can talk about all these things, but are you being used by God? Are you touching anybody's need? So he touched the need, and what did he do? He poured in the oil and the wine. He bandaged him. All of a sudden now, instead of dying, he's getting health coming into his body. And when the, now he, he realizes he needs help, he gets his what? Donkey. Where's the donkey? <laughs> right. Thank you. Come on. Come on. All right, now, just kneel down on all fours right here. Kneel down on all fours. All right, now, take, take the traveler. He's well. He's getting well now. And don't put your way. I don't want to hurt him, but he's strong. All right, on your knees, on your knees so that you, you can just go. The, all right, now, what you do is here is, uh, here is the leash, all right? <laughs> All right, all right now. All right, now wait a minute. Where, 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 where's the innkeeper? Where's the innkeeper? We need the innkeeper. All right, come on, come on. We need the innkeeper over here because we need to know where we're going. All right, so the innkeeper is over here. We have now the Samaritan. We have the traveler that's now regaining his strength, and we have the donkey. All right, come on. Let's let's let's, let's bring him over. Come on. All right, come on. I told you you'd never forget it. I told you that. I say you'll never forget this. All right, here we go. Now, what do you say to the innkeeper? Take care of him, and anything that you need extra, I'll come back and pay for. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen? Oh, you guys. Thank you. My goodness. Hey, 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 come on. Thank you very much. That's good. And you get an A+. Plus. I want you to know that. Thank you. All right. Now, oh, this is a one-point message. All of that now was introduction, teaching. But the one point is this. He came to where he was. That means that this is a wonderful place called a sanctuary, but the real work of the gospel happens outside the sanctuary. Do you, if you take a look at Jesus' ministry, Jesus' ministry was outside the sanctuary. The woman at the well, <laughs> the lame man, the blind man, just walking down a street, all of a sudden there is a divine appointment that, that we look at and it changes our lives when we see the power of God at work. So 
at one point, they, he came to where he was. I'm going to conclude by telling you today, this morning, where God came to a lady and changed her life. I entitle this The Rose. The Rose. My wife and I were privileged to pastor a great church, Central Assembly of God, Springfield, Missouri. And in that church, it was approaching Valentine's Day, and uh, I had my message, and it was late, at, late Saturday night, about 10.30. Well, that's late for me, about 10.30. I'm just going over my notes. Whenever this thought comes to me, buy a dozen roses. Now, any man here will know that that's not him. That's God. Okay. So that's the truth. I, I see all the men going like this. Buy a dozen roses, and I don't want to buy a dozen roses. I'm tired. I've got a big day. It's Valentine's Sunday, and God wants me to buy a dozen. So I'm arguing with God in my chair. Have you done that? Just think about it. God arguing with God. And I was trying to tell God something he didn't know. I was trying to tell him all the flower stores are shut. It's 1030. And the thought comes to me, the grocery store on Kearney. Oh, what was the name of that? Anyway, there's a grocery store on Kearney Street that was all night. And that had a flower department. And so the flower department stayed open all night. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm. So now I have to get up, I have to comb my hair, I have to go, because I'm a pastor of this great church, now I've got to go through all this stuff. I was ready for bed. Dress, go. I make my, my way down to, um, I wish I could name that, Dylan's Grocery Store. Hmm. Dylan's Grocery Store. Walk into Dylan's Grocery Store, walk back to the flower department. All the, fl all the roses are gone. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, what am I doing? So I'm standing there looking around for roses because that's buy a dozen roses. There's no roses. So uh, a clerk came from the back and said, can I help you? I said, yes, I'm here to buy a dozen roses. Well, we're sold out. We sold out of roses early today. But there was another clerk that came over and said, wait a minute. There is a, a, a beautiful uh, rose display in the back that the person one hour ago canceled. Now, that's important. A person canceled, and when they brought out this floral display, it was one of the most beautiful floral displays I've ever seen, rose display. Can I buy it? Sure. So I bought this beautiful rose display that... It was supposed to be somebody else's, but they canceled the order. I take it to the church, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do with this? Because God doesn't give you his plans. Many times you walk by faith. And so here it is. I put the roses on the organ, and I leave and I go home, and I'm thankful that it's over. Isn't that just like it? I mean, God is about to do something great, and we're just thankful to be over because it's not in our agenda, but it's in God's agenda. So now the next day, next day is a powerful day. The worship service, everything goes like I had planned it to go, and all of a sudden now I'm in the word, going into the Word, and I see these roses out of the corner of my eye, and I'm thinking, ooh, I don't want to do this because it's not in my plan. So I said, folks, I just want you to know what has happened. Last night, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to get a dozen roses for somebody. So I went out and I bought a dozen roses, and I've got them here, but I don't know who in the world this is for. And then I thought politically. See, when we're human beings, and we want it to be helping us. What's in it for me? 
and, and I'm going to be honest. Uh, here I am, a pastor, supposed to be a spiritual person, but I'm thinking, how can I manipulate this so that I get some stuff? So I see Mrs. Wanamaker in the back. Now, Mrs. Wanamaker was the wife of the pastor, the legend that he, he pastored uh, 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 Central for 20 four years or 25 years and so everybody loves Mrs. Wanamaker and I'm thinking everybody will love me the new pastor for me to bring these beautiful roses to Mrs. Wanamaker so politically I'm thinking this is a win-win thank you God and I'm going up the the aisle to her when all of a sudden the Lord says not on the left side on the right side a visitor that you don't know. Now, these are thoughts. No voices. These are only thoughts. And my wife says she knew that I was in trouble because she knows when I get this look on my face when I don't know what I'm doing. And I got here and I had that look. Like, I'm headed for Mrs. Wanamaker, but you don't want me to do it, and I don't like this. So I turned now everybody's confused because everybody had it figured out that I was going to Mrs. Wanamaker. I turned and I started going over here. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, who, who don't I know? And so I, I go up to, oh, it's about uh, halfway up. There was a blonde-headed lady that I had never met before. And I ha I'm carrying this vase filled with a dozen roses that I want to get rid of so I can get back to my plan. So I say to her, and, and as I'm coming up, listen to this, as I'm coming up, the Lord again gives this thought to me, tell her that I love her and that I'm proud of her. Tell her that I love her and that I'm proud of her, right? So I said, I just want you to know and she's been watching all this, so she knows that this is, this is spontaneous. I just want you to know that I feel like God wants me to tell you that he loves you and that he's proud of you. And I give her the roses as she begins to cry. But honestly, I'm ready for my sermon. I don't have time for somebody crying. Isn't that so dumb for men? Yes, amen. Amen. So anyway, I get back, I preach my message, I open up the altar. There were several that came down for salvation, and I always pray with the people that come down for salvation personally for, for, to, to just tell them that God is doing something special in their lives. And I don't see, but this woman has come down, and she's standing over here waiting for me. And so I finish with all the prayers, and now the people, most of the people have left, and I'm feeling badly because I made her wait for me because I didn't see her. And I said, oh, I am so sorry. I, I didn't see you waiting. And she, I said, can I help you? She says, you already have. Can I tell you the story? You see, I'm a, I'm a Paul Harvey fan. I want to know the rest of the story. She says, I'm a postal worker. I deliver mail. And she says, um, I'm delivering these Valentines on Friday. And all of a sudden, I realize that she's been divorced twice, and every man that's been in her life has used her and left her. And so here are, she's giving all these wonderful Valentines to people, and she doesn't feel any love in her life. And then she goes back to her dad. And she said, I was an athlete. I was a good athlete in junior high, high school, outstanding. And my dad never came to any of my games. And he never told me that he loved me or he was proud of me. And she says, I stopped on the sidewalk, I looked up to heaven, and she said, if there is a God, she didn't go to church, if there is a God in heaven, you will somehow tell me that you love me and that you're proud of me. Now, did you, did you just hear what I said? Let, let me say it again in case you missed it. 
I just want you to know, God, that I want you to tell me you're proud of me and that you love me because men have used me. My own dad never told me that he loved me once. My own dad never gave me a hug. My own dad never came to my games. My own, and she's feeling all of this. Now, she comes to church because her daughter is my, my daughter's best friend. So she comes to church on this Valentine Sunday. The pastor that she doesn't know, she's a first-time visitor, walks down to her and presents her with the most beautiful vase of roses. Is God good? Give the Lord a clap offering. Is God good? And delivers her a message that he loves her. Not a love that's going to use her or abuse her, but a love that loves her. And by the way, I'm proud of you. And every time I tell that story, I pray for somebody that, that I would go to in the service and give them a rose and let the story continue. A spontaneous time for, for me to just be sensitive to the congregation that I'm in. And I'm going to give somebody this rose, and I want you to take this rose and put it on your dresser or some places you can see, and I want this rose to speak to you. That no matter what you're going through right now, I love you. I'm proud of you. And all things are going to work together for good. Now, this morning I should have had two roses because I'm feeling like there's two people that I want to go to. And I just want to uh, share that a word of encouragement. And the encouragement is that God is with you, that all things are going to work together for good, and that not to fear, but that God is going to help you. Rose, here, I want you to take that rose and put it somewhere where you see it, and I want it to speak to you, that God knows, and that all things are going to work together for good, and that he loves you, and here it is, and that he's proud of you. Stand with me. Now, how are we going to end this service? Here's how we're going to end the service. I believe that this service is a divine appointment. I believe that there are people here that God wants me now to talk to you. I've, I've talked to individuals but now God wants me to talk to somebody, and here it is. Why did I preach this sermon? In fact, why am I here? I'm here to tell somebody that I haven't told yet, that I haven't spoken to, that God loves you, and that no matter what has happened, no matter what you are going through right now, it's time. He wants to do something special for you. Like the lady on aisle four, it's time. How did you know I didn't? But God knows that somebody's here right now. My wife said somebody's life is about to be changed forever. He wants to do something special for you, and it's time for you to have a fresh start. Do you hear me? No matter what has happened, it's time for a fresh start. It's time for a new beginning. And I want to have the privilege of praying with you for God to do something special for you. So, 
if I'm talking to you right now, that you feel like this moment is a special divine appointment between you and God, and I'm speaking to you and the need that you're going through right now, I want you to step out, and I want you to come to the altar. Wherever you are, just step out.